All right, troops, strong and conditioned, live and direct from Glasgow, Scotland. And tonight's guest needs no introduction. He is the guest who has made the most appearances at this point on my podcast. And for good reason, it is the one and only Jared Miller. Jared, how are you, brother? Doing great, Lee. How about yourself? <clears throat> yeah, great, great. Absolutely great. I've probably been up since 5 30 because my kids are like, mm -hmm. my son always wants to come into my bedroom really early. And his sister hears him doing the same and she wants to come in. And once you know two of them are up, then you're up. Mm -hmm. you, you just need to get up and start, start your day. So that's been the norm for the last week or two. Yep. yep. I mean, it's starting to uh, take its toll on me. But uh, for a guy like you who, who wakes up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> and starts a absolutely crushing workout, like, you probably think he's moaning. He's talking a lot of shit here. Well, you know, I, I, I say I do that on purpose because when you start your day off with the absolute worst possible thing you're going to encounter, it's all just good from there. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm always in a great mood because uh, that's behind me. Okay, right. So, so what is your strategy, right? So, you wake up well, a day in the life of a, a training day in the life mm -hmm. of Jared Miller. All right. You wake up at what time? Uh, usually about four twenty-five. Four twenty-five. And is there any ritual that takes place prior to the workout? Uh, it's pretty quick. So uh, the big thing is, I'm the only one that's awake, so I'm trying not to wake everyone else out. So I sneak out of the bedroom. Uh, all my clothes are actually at the bottom of my stairs. So I'm, I'm in my underwear, come downstairs. Uh, I, um, I train fasted, but I do have a shake in the middle of the night, which kind of helps ease that. But I'll, uh, I'll drink some uh, green tea mixed with a little bit of creatine and some electrolytes right before the workout starts, throw on my clothes, get into the garage. And so that's about a five minute process. And uh, from there, usually I'll, I'll make sure to load everything up the night before because I don't want to waste any time doing all that in the morning of, I, I try to keep the schedule as tight as I can. And that way I'm yeah. able to get into the first working set pretty quick into that. And then uh, yeah. I've, I've been recording every single session now. And, and people are always like, you know, well, you know, how long do these sessions take? I'm like, the, the recording's right there. That you're watching the whole session. I'm not skipping any part of it. So that's, that's usually what it is. Uh, I get in, I train. And uh, by the time that's done, it's usually about um, 5.50. And then uh, shower, bake breakfast, get the kid off to school. And then uh, I walk my dog with a weight vest on before I go to work. So I'm able to get in a little uh, extra steps that way. And off to work I go from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, something you said there was very funny and it resonates with me. And it's when you wake up and I imagine you tiptoe out of the room so you don't wake anyone up. Mm -hmm. Does your wife afford you the same treatment when she has to get up early? Uh, it's not often she has to beat me to, uh, getting up. <laughs> so, uh, she's, she, she definitely would if she ever needed to, I'm sure. But, uh, usually I'm, yeah. I'm the first one that's up. Yeah. I it's, it's, really the, it's really the dog. I have to not wake up because once the dog's woken up, just like your kids, it's game over. Yeah. I tend to find that men in the morning are very like, they're like a ninja in a 1980s Kung Fu movie mm -hmm. trying to get out of the room. Whereas your other half has got the hairdryer on and. <laughs> they're illustrating and they're like they're just everything's going wild and it's it's, it's no way it's well, yeah. it's not a carnage it's not a we carnage all, we all woke up, grew up watching the ninja turtles so any chance we have to pretend to be one of them will be one <laughs> okay so like once you have finished work is there a training session that comes in the night these days not so much um we usually go for a, a walk with the family um otherwise if i do have a chance i'll try to get in some uh, uh, prisoner squats and push-ups and that's just something I stole from Jamie Lewis his uh, feast famine and ferocity program talked about doing 300 of those a day just to maintain uh, human balance yeah yeah so uh, that sounds to me like you've you've scaled down the the workout frequency on a daily mm -hmm. basis is there any particular reason for that you know the big thing was it's I'm, I'm at a point now where the amount of training I need to do to get the results that I want isn't as significant as it was before. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm training just a bit more effectively than I was before. It's a little bit more dialed in and, and it's a little bit more focused on uh, kind of a broader spectrum of, fi of fitness. And that's where walking is really taking a big part of uh, my training there. I do, I do try to get in that evening walk, but a lot of it too is just prioritizing time with the family 
uh, making the most of the the good weather that we've had here because a lot of that stuff was it was winter and I was crammed inside. I was like, well, I might as well get something done here. But up until recently, it's been very nice weather. It's been a good opportunity to get outside and just get vitamin D and and spend some time with the kiddo and the wife. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, how how are, how are the workouts programmed nowadays? Like, I know, like the last the first time we spoke, they were like there was a lot of conditioning work in there. Mm -hmm. Is are you still continuing in that same vein, or are you like down some other rabbit hole at this point? Yeah. So, it, it conditioning still in the forefront, but also some other rabbit hole absolutely sums it up. Uh, I, I recently released a an idea for a, a ebook that I'm I'm currently living. Uh, Chaos is the plan, the plan. And uh, what it boiled down to is, I said I'm going to write a training ebook in three sentences. And you know, from there, of course, there's there's going to be ways that you can expand on that. But it boiled down to spend 180 minutes a week picking something off the floor and putting it over your head. Right. Eat meat and eggs when hungry until you're not, and never repeat the same workout or the same meal twice in a row. And right, I said, okay. that's going to be the plan. Right, okay, that, that, that gives me a lot to work with. I'm glad you brought that up because I have seen this this book mentioned and I have had a, a brief overview. In fact, I had a wee look today at it. So the idea behind 180 minutes of lifting stuff above your head, is that, like, is, is that just a broad time span you've created or... Is it as every session focused to ensure that you hit that 180 minutes, which is either a minimum or a maximum? So that's that's definitely a minimum and it's a goal. You, if, if for some reason you feel the need to go above it, that's fine. Now, I came to that number just by saying, you know, that's three 60 minute lifting sessions a week. And for the average Joe, that's that's pretty typical. You go to the gym three times a week for an hour. Uh, but if you want to go more frequently, then you can reduce the time. And then what I thought was really cool about that was it was kind of liberating because it meant not every session needs to be uniform in length. You know, the, the we, we like round numbers. We like a base 10 system. So we like to say, well, I'll take 180. I'll divide it by six. That gives me 30 minutes. But I've I've had weeks where it's like, all right, well, the way my schedule shook out, I only have five minutes to lift today. So there's five minutes of overhead work. But I've got 75 minutes that I can do on this day. So now I've got 80 minutes total. And so I, I just shoot for a a broad goal there. And then what I find is cool is in those five minute sessions that I have, they're intense sessions. So I'm like, I've only got five minutes. Let's go ahead and just blow my brains out and see what I can do. The longer sessions I can stretch out, I can make them more just kind of type two conditioning, something that gets the heart rate elevated, but isn't killing me. And then I just go for max reps. It the Having that number as a guideline instead of a hard set rule allows me to really sort of play with what I'm doing there. Yeah. So, so why why the the focus on lifting overhead? I've just from my own experience and looking historically, and it, it's it's worth noting it's not just lifting overhead, but it's got to be something that's on the floor to begin with. Because if yeah. you just take it out of the rack, that's a that's a different element. But taking something off the floor, picking it up, and getting it over your head somehow, some way, it really just makes the whole body come into play, which I think is really valuable as far as developing a, a physique. And, and strength. And, and what I've said about this protocol is people already look at it and criticize it from the perspective of powerlifting, Olympic lifting, strongman, CrossFit, et cetera, et cetera. And I say what this will do is it will not achieve a specific goal. It'll have your body realize its own potential. And it'll yeah. eventually everyone who would follow it would gravitate towards some sort of optimal humanity. Uh, and and yeah. you know, that's only right from Nietzsche there, the, the overman. But it's this idea that you know, if you start out and you're overweight, you're over fat and you keep doing this and you abide by the nutritional principles, your body will naturally gravitate towards a, a more slim, leaner physique because it's trying to survive what's experiencing there. But if you start out skinny and you keep doing this, your body's going to add the necessary amount of muscle in order to be able to overcome constantly this demand of picking something up and putting it over your head. Ultimately, yeah. it's the longest range of motion you can possibly have. Uh, aside from if you were to start from a prone position, which is something I'm thinking about adding into it is have level changes and also pick something up and put it over your head. So like start with a burpee, come out of the burpee, pick up something, put it over your head. Now you've gone flat from the floor to over your head. But in either case, it's just a very long range of motion. And it's really just kind of dominating whatever sort of weight or implement you have to to work with. Yeah, yeah. So something sticks out to me there when you mention a physique because nowadays 
like physique based training is very focused it's very mm. focused on body parts biomechanics whereas your approach it, it, it doesn't seem to have that type of focus not at all so what is the outcome of that style of work what kind of physique is it going to build uh, uh you know this this harkens to something i've written and that was the idea of being that which does and uh, it's it's ultimately this idea that it, any any creature that is picking something up that's heavy and putting it over its head many times, its body is going to have to eventually become the kind of body that can do that. And yes, of course, you know it, this is not going to achieve a bodybuilding physique because bodybuilding is a very specific physique, and it's ultimately an illusionary physique. It's about trying to not just be the biggest, but to look the biggest. And we do that by bringing the waist in and tapering it, making the lateral deltoids really big, making the quad sweep out. But the the physique this would accomplish is the physique of someone who is mighty enough to take heavy things off the floor and put it up over their head. So you you look at the Farnese Hercules, the the Greek statue there. He, he's not a bodybuilding physique. No, his pecs are small. His legs are athletic, but they're not grossly out of proportion. He's got thick obliques because he's carrying stuff over his head and his midsection needs to be large and solid to be able to do that. But at the same time, you look at the Farnese Hercules and he's jacked. He is a <laughs> big, strong yeah. dude. And if you were to encounter him in a street, you would not think, oh, his pecs are small. You would say, I really hope he's in a good mood today. I hope I have not upset this person. <laughs> And, and so, yeah, ultimately, it's it's the, the physique that you get is a physique you arrive at through becoming that which puts things over your head. Yeah, yeah. It's almost an anti-optimal approach. Mm -hmm. And how how did you come to this approach? Like, what, what, Because you, you were just like any other meathead, like mm -hmm. you've explained in other podcasts where you, you're like, beginnings of your journey were, bodybuilding centric as well most people and there's been a complete evolution of your training style over the years you've went powerlifting you've went to strongman and you've came up with this like this hybrid training style which incorporates strongman probably a wee bit of powerlifting but there's some bodybuilding sensibilities in there as well because there's the physique is also part of the outcome absolutely how did we get to the point we are at now what was what was the thought process and you know it's so funny it's all circular because at the beginning when i was 14 years old i didn't know i didn't know there was a sport called powerlifting i'd seen yeah. strongman once before all lifting was bodybuilding i didn't know what olympic lifting was and at that age i was just throwing anything against the wall and seeing what stuck and I was copying things from martial arts movies and, and action films and stories from my dad. And I just exercised was all I did. And so that meant I would bench press and do concentration curls and do chin-ups and pull-ups and run and push-ups. And, and I would just do anything and everything. And then the more you learn, the stupider you get. Because you, you learn what powerlifting is. You're like, oh, the big three. That's all you need. All you need is the big three. So I'm just going to do that. And then you get stuck because you're only doing those three movements and you haven't trained your biceps and you end up blowing them out and you have no mobility. So then you fall in the CrossFit rabbit hole to try to fix that. And we spend so much time just being in these camps and trying to have an identity through what we, what we do, thinking that's who we are. And I, I lived through that. I definitely, you know, flew the flag and said, I'm, uh, you know, the big three or die. And then, uh, you know, strong man. And after enough time, you just kind of get fed up with it. And, and you realize you're limiting yourself by limiting yourself. And there's so much more out there that if you're willing to take the risk and just try something different, you can develop so many more areas and avenues of fitness. And so many of these things that we're holding back from are, are weak points. Um, yeah, yeah. I know you're always apprehensive of telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you, you You kind of just go, I'm doing this, you're yeah. more than welcome to try it and you may get a similar outcome. However, if you know what you know now and you were beginning again, how would you start the journey? Uh, if, if it were me personally or if I yeah, had... I don't want to ask you out, right? Because I know you're quite coy about giving direct advice to people they should do this they should do that but i mean like to put yourself in your own shoes if you were beginning again knowing mm -hmm. what you know now 
Mm. How would you approach the journey you are on from a beginner's perspective? And the big thing I say, and it always upsets people, is I say play a sport. I would play a sport before I did anything else. And, and that is what I did. I played sports before I did anything else because the act of play is so significant for developing the ability to be an athlete. And so many people skip that trying to be an athlete first and, and they spend years trying to learn skills that take months to develop. Uh, if I played a sport where I was running, jumping, shifting laterally, moving my body through space, colliding with other humans, avoiding colliding with other humans, learning how to strain, learning the difference between pain and injury, learning the difference between pushing too hard and pushing just hard enough, all these incredibly valuable things that you can just pick up instinctively by just playing would be huge. And I'd make sure to do that. Uh, once I had that down, then I would engage in actual training. Uh, I would limit that initially to, to body weight stuff, uh, machines, dumbbells, and, and practice the barbell lifts with a, with a straight bar or a broomstick or something, but ultimately just work on developing that coordination and basic strength skill set before I really started pushing hard. Uh, from there, uh, if I could, I would get instruction on, on the basics of uh, cleans and just the quick lifts, just because at a beginning stage, that's the time to learn those things. I, anyone who's seen my videos knows that my clean is just a total monstrosity. Uh, at this point, it's actually kind of what benefits my, my brute strength is the fact that I don't have any skill to back it up. But it would be nice to be able to have that option should it arise. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I avoided the power lifts when I was initially starting because I was told they were dangerous. And so that sucked. It would have been nice to have learned how to properly hinge at the hip. So, you know, kettlebell swings initially for that and then eventually into some deadlifts. Uh, learning how to brace my core for the squats would have been a, a phenomenal skill to develop early. Uh, and then from there, it you know, just stick with the basics. Uh, Dan John talks about how the power lifts and the Olympic lifts put together are probably the best combination of programs you can have. And I can definitely see that. I would like to use kettlebells put in there just because there's so much you can do with that stuff. Keep the body weight going. Uh, but that, that initial foundation of sports and then some basics there, sled dragging, conditioning, all, all that stuff. Uh, I think I'd, I'd rather have a broad spectrum approach at the very beginning there uh, and just kind of just try everything, different rep ranges, different sets. And and if I decided to focus, I'd focus from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To comment on your clean, I, I, like, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I, I will say that your clean is not the most aesthetic clean. You, you're, you're just getting the weight up there. But I, I think there's merit in that because you're just doing it. Like you're just getting the weight up there, and it's it's not optimal, but it's still going to have a, a like a positive response on the body oh as long God. as you're keeping it safe to a certain degree, as long as you're not like jerking your spine into some mm -hmm. contorted position or anything like that. But what you're doing is you're giving liberation to guys like myself who are not really adept at these movements and letting them know that just go for it. Don't be hamstrung by technique. Just get the weight up there as long as you're doing it in a safe, controlled manner. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a positive on your part with regards to technique. Well, I appreciate what, that. What, what is your actual opinion? Do you think technique can be a limiting factor in some respects for people in the sense that they can focus too much on technique and it will hold them back because it starts to like breach into the area where they're actually not using as much weight or strength as they should be to elicit a response. Yep. yep. So there's, there's a two prong issue there and, and you've uh, touched on both of them there. And one is uh, absolutely people will worry too much about technique deviation. They never get to the point where that they actually push hard enough to elicit a response to the body because the, the, the body does not like adding muscle to it. Muscle is metabolically expensive. It takes a lot to build muscle. It takes a lot to maintain muscle. And if given the choice, the body won't build it. So you have to place a demand on it and basically give it a stress signal that says building muscle is safer than not. Because if you do not build muscle, we will die. And you do that by stressing it significantly in training. Well, that kind of stress is eventually going to drive technique deviation. Anyone who maintains perfect technique 100% of 100 reps, they're not going to be pushing hard enough to cause that response. So ultimately, we need to let it deviate a little bit. Ideally, in a safe manner, yes, but still have some form where the, the technique starts deviating. The other issue is that technique allows you to move more weight than bad technique. But where people can get mixed up there is technique also means efficiency. And sometimes efficiency works against our goal. If we want to build 
the strongest arms possible, then an inefficient curl is much better than a power curl where we're calling in the hips and the glutes and, and all the other muscles to move the weight as much as we can because we're not actually hitting the bicep the way we want it to be hit. So, you know, people comment on my back. My back is very well developed for, for what I've done with it. And that's because my technique is so bad that I have to rely on my back to move things because I can't use triple extension as well as some other guys. Or, or another great example is you look at the shoulders of elite strongmen versus elite, elite weightlifters. Elite weightlifters put more weight overhead than strongmen, but their technique is so good that a lot of that's coming from their lower body that's jerking the weight up. A strong yeah. man doesn't have that sort of technique, so they have to use their shoulders. And in doing that, they develop much broader, stronger shoulders because of a lack of technique to drive it there. So yeah. you know, it's good to have technique. Don't get me wrong. I think it's great to have that in your back pocket should you ever need to rely on those things. It's better to have more tools than fewer. But a lot of people, they get so obsessed with chasing that technique that they forget that we're here sometimes to be inefficient to, in order to drive that response. Yeah. So in order to like build muscle, should efficiency be like a thing that we should be concerned about? Because when I think, I mean, I'm just going on a tangent here, but when I think about efficiency, I tend to think about swimmers. Like if I go swimming and I have to do a 25 meter test, I've got bad technique. I'm going to have to power through the process and I'm going to gas out really quickly. Whereas there's people who are in a lot worse shape than me but they have really efficient technique and they just glide through the water and it doesn't look like they're putting any stress on the body. Do you think something, if it's too efficient, then it's going to take the stress away from the movement, which is going to create that response? A hundred percent. And so that, that's why the third sentence of my book was never repeat the same workout twice in a row. It's this idea of never adapting. Because yeah. if we're in a state where we're never actually able to get good at what we're doing, then we're constantly in a state where we're inefficient and floundering and struggling. And, and that's not unprecedented. John Anderson and John Meadows, two Johns, have both talked about how they never have the same workout twice. They, they would always strive to make something different so that the body could not adapt and they're able to place great stress on it. Then you look at uh, Mike Menser, as, as controversial of a figure as he might be, his whole, you know, take – three to 10 days between workouts, same thing. You could not get good at a workout by having such long rest periods in between them. And as a result, you did not adapt. And every time you trained, you placed your body under significant stress. CrossFit kind of operates off this idea where you're always changing the modality so that there's no ability to adapt. And that's constantly putting you in a state of uh, uh, stimulated adaptation. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of theory out there that would at least support that idea. Yeah. Do you think, though, you have to like build the foundations before you can start to take that approach with regards to having a different workout every day? Because, I, sorry, go ahead. Because I'm thinking, like, you're not be, like like measuring progressive overload in some respects. A beginner will have to stick to the same lifts probably for a certain amount of time to ensure that they are getting stronger instead of just doing a different workout every single day where they can't really measure accurately the progress they're making. Yep. yep. And, and so that's the, the big thing is uh, programs like uh, strong lifts and starting strength. People don't understand that these are 12 to 16 week programs and that is entirely their goal. And that's why they're built the way they're built is you go to the gym three times a week, you do the exact same moves every time you go. And by 12 to 16 weeks, you've developed a basic level of mastery of those movements so that when the time comes to train for real, which is what I always say that upsets people, now you have the ability to execute these lifts with proficiency. Because you're absolutely right. I, I mean, heck, we, we put kids in Bumblebee soccer leagues. And same thing, they spend maybe three weeks learning how to play soccer, and then we put them in a game. When I wrestled, I wrestled for one month, and then I went to my first meet. And I had to compete against other people that have been wrestling their whole lives. It's like, you know how to shoot a double leg, you know how to sprawl, congratulations, you know how to wrestle. But other people want to run these programs for like three years before they actually start training for real. It's like, no, like give yourself some credit. You spent 16 weeks going to the gym three times a week doing the same movement each time. You know how to squat now. You, and yes, we can always tweak technique. We can make improvements. But at one point, we know enough that we can start doing some real training. And maybe it doesn't have to be a different workout every single time. But the other part of that, too, is in those 12 to 16 weeks, you're not going to be putting on a whole lot of muscle. 
It's just yeah. you, you're you're so bad at lifting weights that your body is just learning how to move through space at that point that you're not even stressing muscles to the point where the body thinks I need to add muscle. All you're doing is you're learning how to move. And your body says, I need to get better at this movement. It doesn't think I need to get stronger. It says, crap, you know, this is a new thing. I better retool my neurons so I know how to do this movement because apparently we're just fucking doing this movement. Sorry, I, I'm not sure about swearing on your channel, but no, that's cool. It's just encouraged. It's encouraged. Okay, okay. yep, yep. And, and, and that's, you know, that's the thing. The body's not stupid. You, you put it in a pattern, it learns the pattern. It's like, well, I better get good at this pattern. It's the same reason why you can't cram at guitar. You can't play guitar one time a week for nine hours and then suddenly be good at it. You got to practice it every day. And 20 minutes a day of guitar will get you much better than nine hours on Sunday. And it's the same with lifting. You just practice it frequently enough that you get good at the skill of lifting and then you can start training for real. Yeah. Do you know, that's a very hot take, Jared. That is a hot take. I, I, do you Are you of the opinion that like programs like, I don't like strong lifts start on strength? Are these like set programs? They are not real training in some respects. Uh, so they're they're not real programs, is what I would say. They're they are routines, and again, that chaps people when I say that. But a program is going to take you all the way through the phases of training. It's going to have an accumulation phase, an intensification phase. If you're com if you're competing, it's going to have a peaking phase. But ultimately, uh, a program should never leave you high and dry. It should never have you ask what now because it's 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 a program. A routine, yeah, it will leave you hung up. It will leave you high and dry. I'm wearing a super squat shirt right now. Super squats ultimately is a routine, but the book has a program in it. And so you run the super squats routine for six weeks, and you do your 20 rep squats. And by the end of that six weeks, you're pretty broken. And then the book says, hey, fret not. Now do the five by five routine that I've included in here. And you run those two together. Now you have a program because it will take you from <clears> – <throat> building up with those 20 rep squats, which is an accumulation phase into a five by five program, which is an intensification phase, right back to the 20 rep squat accumulation phase. But strong lifts and, and starting strength, starting strength solution when you got to the end of your five by, or three by five was to drop the volume even more and start going into one by five and then start, and, and I might be misspeaking there, but ultimately it was a reduction in volume. And then you went to the Texas method, which is again, a different protocol. And that one still had you in sets of five, but it was having you drop volume even more. There was never a time where you ever accumulated the volume back up. And eventually yeah. trainees would just get stagnant in that approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so I want to move on to the part two of the book, the, the meat and eggs. That's mm -hmm. the one that fascinates me. Absolutely. Because this, this, this will definitely upset some people. <laughs> Because you, you have had quite the nutritional journey. I mean, mm -hmm. we've already spoke about it on length. The insanity that you were going through, trying to cram in calories, eating constantly to fuel these intense training sessions. Mm -hmm. However, I think now we've, we've flipped a coin in that respect. Yeah. So let's go through the meat and eggs concept. Yep. So, you know, the, the, again, people look at that and they say, you won't be able to eat enough to, to build muscle. You won't be able to eat enough to X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And again, this program is about realization. It's about becoming. And it, it upsets people because you don't know what the end of the story is. You know, you look at super squats and the book says how to build 30 pounds of muscle in six weeks. And a uh, dog crap marketed itself as uh, building 52 or what, 50 pounds of muscle in 52 weeks. And all these things that tell you this program is a hypertrophy program. This program is a, is a strength program. And this program is a shake the eight ball and see what answer you get sort of program. And the meat and eggs are, do exactly that. You, you abide by the principles and at the end, your body will reveal what it is. Uh, you've commented that I've gotten leaner and, and that is ultimately what it boiled down to is I was eating so hard to be at a body weight of 200 pounds. And when I started eating meat and eggs when I was hungry until I was not, my body just lost just so much fluff. And and I'm yeah, I'm I'm lighter. That's absolutely true. But I'm the leanest I've ever been in my life. And I'm constantly eating. And I shouldn't say constantly eating. I eat two to three times a day. The frequency is down. But when I do eat, it is massive portions. And I posted my meals online. And so, you know, that's that's just kind of the broad overview. But like the, the intent behind it is this idea that, that meat and eggs, they're, they're natural foods 
they they they've existed in our diet for for millennia yeah. and uh, i specifically go out of my way not to add seasonings i don't artificially flavor them because the right. body will have a natural hunger response system to it when we don't trick it when we don't deceive it and meat and eggs are very natural food so that when we eat them eventually we stop wanting to eat them eventually the body says yeah. all right hey thanks i'm good now but like you, yeah, you, take, you take chips or crisp or something like that and and you just don't ever stop yeah sorry, well, too much well, what do you mean with seasonings like can you be more specific are you talking about like a garlic granules or are you speaking about like a hot sauce or something like that all the all the above the, the only thing i put on my food is salt and it, and it ultimately that's because that's a mineral we're, we're a salt seeking uh, species and and yeah. it has a good electrolyte quality to it but yeah, yeah I, I let my food taste like what my food tastes like so my food tastes like meat and eggs yeah it i get the impression that it's also a tool that can be used to break bad food behavior like for example people who like to eat chocolate at the end of the night or people that feel that they they need to eat a certain type of food at a certain time of the day in order to fuel performance is, is that part of the premise it, it's been so paradigm breaking for me. You have no idea. Uh, anyone that's ever followed my food logs prior, they, I was eating something pretty much every 30 minutes. And I was just yeah. always in a state of putting something in my mouth, chewing, eating, swallowing, uh, snacking frequently. And I switched to this. And, what, you know, it was the big thing was I it's eat until you're not hungry because I was always leaving the table hungry. I was always leaving wherever I went to hungry. I was not eating enough food. And it, I had this idea in my head that there was a certain limit. And once I reached, I couldn't eat that anymore. And I, I stopped doing that. And I just keep eating meat and eggs until my body eventually says, hey, we're good. We don't need any more of that. And, yeah. and then I wait until I'm hungry again, because I was on a clock constantly. I was like, I have to eat at this time. I have to eat at this time. I have to eat at this time. And instead, I just let it go until I'm hungry. Because the, the body, when you're feeding it, just actual natural food will have a time where it says, all right, I need more of that. Now I've, I've exhausted all those nutrients, but when you feed it things that are artificially made to be hyper palatable and don't provide a whole lot of nourishment, you, you keep on eating and eating and eating and you never reach satiety. And then when you're done, you've jacked up your insulin and, and you weren't really satisfied to begin with such that you're looking for a snack as the meal's done. I used to eat while I was cooking because I was still so hungry. Then I would eat the meal and then I'd have the post meal snack and dessert. And yeah, absolutely. Like you said, this, it, it absolutely breaks paradigms. And the thing is you have to be willing to let your paradigm be broken. If you're the kind yeah. of guy that says I have to eat at this time and then at this time, it's going to be very hard to make that work. But if you really abide by, I'm going to eat when I'm hungry and I'm going to stop when I'm not, and I'm going to wait until the next time rolls around again, then then it's so much simpler and that was really the big thing is i wanted to write just the simplest protocol i could come up with because everything is so complicated online that yeah. i wanted to prove that it doesn't need to be and i was like yeah. here's here's two foods meat and eggs here's one <laughs> movement put something over your head do it for 180 minutes and then just don't ever do the same thing twice and i congratulations i have freed you there's your three sentence training manual go and be awesome and, and oh. yeah, it's not optimal. You won't be the best at anything, but you'll be pretty damn awesome if you do that. And that was really yeah. my goal. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely genius. It's, it's particularly when, when you spell it out. But something like when you talk about learning to stop eating when you're hungry, how do you master that skill? Because speaking from experience, I'm quite greedy. Like when I start eating, I know I'm not hungry. I want to keep eating. How do you like master that ability to identify that moment? Again, the big you're not hungry. The big thing is the food choices. If you're if you are adding seasonings, if you're adding artificially increased palatability elements to the food, if you're right. eating things that aren't meat and eggs, you're absolutely right. The it sends a signal to your brain that is telling you, I need to keep consuming this. Because the we again, the body's not stupid. When it tastes those good things, it says Whatever this is, I need more of it in my life because I'm not going to get it again. Because in nature, you would rarely encounter whatever that flavor is. And it knew that this was something magic. Uh, yeah. It, it, it might have been like super sweet fruit or honey or any sort of just really rich uh, carbohydrate flavor 
that the body knew this is special and this doesn't come around all that often. So keep on eating it until you get physically sick. But the, the food that we had in abundance, the body, it, it's got great nutrients in it. And so the body will want it until it doesn't. And what, it's like it's like putting gas in your car or, or petrol for uh, you guys over the pond there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can't you can't just keep putting it in. Eventually you reach a limit and says, all right, I'm done. And it overflows. But the, the stuff that has that artificial palatability to it, you know, it's it's going to have that limit. Now, I've, I've absolutely gorged myself at meals. Uh, I've posted some of my uh, my outings at uh, Brazilian steakhouses. This Thanksgiving, I, I ate uh, both the drumsticks and the wings and a lot of the dark meat off a 19 pound bird. I've, I've eaten until I've been physically, I, I posted that video of the, the five pound cheeseburger I ate. You know, I've eaten until I've been physically sick. But the other element is you gorge yourself. That's totally fine. Wait until you're hungry again for the next meal. And I've had full 24 hour days where I'm like, I'm still not hungry. I eat so much food in that one sitting that I'm I'm good. And as long as you abide by that principle, your body will you reach a, a natural regulation period. Those those periods yeah. are, are great periods to have, but they're gonna follow up with a period of fasting, which is just pretty natural. Yeah, yeah. I actually feel like shit now. Like I feel quite like I feel like a light bulb's went off in my head because before we started this podcast tonight, I intentionally made chicken thighs because I'm trying to eat a lot more meat as opposed to like I'm trying to drop the carbs a wee bit and so mm -hmm. forth. And I doused them in <laughs> garlic. Mm -hmm. And I could have eat I ate two, but I could have easily eaten about four or five. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because I never really looked at it from that angle where I'm increase, increasing the, the palpability by adding like something like garlic. I thought I like that's why I asked because I assumed you were speaking about like Frank's hot sauce <laughs> or like sriracha sauce mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. I thought garlic would be, yeah, you can eat garlic or herbs or something like that. Mm -hmm. but I never expected the answer just to be salt. Well, and, and you know, it's it's very interesting, and, and it took me a while to get there as well. And it's one of those yeah. where I just started asking you, why am I doing this? Why yeah. why am I trying to make the food taste like what it's not? And and ultimately, that's the you know, it, it didn't happen overnight for me either. It's one of those where the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, what I'm doing is not making sense. And again, it's not without precedent. Marty Gallagher talked about this in Purposeful Primitive, the idea of becoming a super taster. And what it boils down to is we've inundated our taste buds. We've lambasted them with artificial flavors to say nothing of natural flavors to the point that they can't really appreciate the flavor that is in just food. But when you start stripping that away and you just do less and less and less, and eventually you just eat the food, the food is delicious. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, your body does not want you to die. <laughs> and yeah. so it will make food taste really good when it's hungry. And just the plainest of meat and just plainest of eggs, they will be phenomenal when you have yeah. been spending 180 minutes a week putting stuff over your head and you are hungry. But yeah. but otherwise, if you're not hungry, you can definitely eat food that's been flavored because it's been made to make you want to eat it even when you're not hungry. Yeah. It, do you know what you've... Natural Hypertrophy made a video a couple of weeks back. It was about his Balkan diet. And he said something that really stuck out to me. And it was about a banana. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about having a sweet tooth. And he mentioned that if a banana doesn't taste overly sweet, then your taste buds are probably being fucked up to a certain degree. Yep. And I never really looked at it. I thought, I mean, when I taste a banana, I just taste like fucking white rice. And what, I, I, sorry. Well, and what's unique about that is the banana that you can buy at a store right now is like no banana that ever existed historically up until this very <laughs> recent era in history. We've genetically made them sweeter, you know. So yeah. yeah, that's the thing. If you can't, if you can't appreciate this genetically modified super sweet banana, then yeah, yeah. absolutely, he's absolutely right. Then something is awry. Yeah. Yeah. So. What's what's this the story with the feasting concept that you sometimes utilize? Because I, you're speaking there that you'll go on a twenty four hour fast, mm -hmm. which may fall like a feasting session, so to mm -hmm. speak. What's what's your mode of attack in that respect? Is it still just meat and eggs, or can you start bringing other things into play to maybe just like fill up glycogen or just give yourself a break from that limited repertoire? 
So, you know, the, the big thing is for me is I'm, I'm not restricting myself when I'm eating meat and eggs. That is what I like to eat. It's all I, it's all I want to eat. And so when I get a chance to feast, I feast on meat and eggs. I just eat a massive quantity of it. Uh, on my birthday, I went to a place called Texas Day Brazil, which is a Brazilian steakhouse. And I just, you know, ate until I couldn't. Uh, Thanksgiving, I just ate until I couldn't. Now, I still <clears throat> have a, I still have moments where it's, uh, breaking away from that protocol. Absolutely right. And and that's when it's a social situation. Ultimately, it's a family meal. My wife is a fantastic cook and she makes great dishes and I'm not going to not enjoy them. And so at that point, though, the, the feasting is more soulful feasting. I'm not gorging myself physically on food. I'm enjoying the food, but I'm enjoying the company that comes with it. My kid will make dessert or my wife will make dessert and I'll enjoy that too because there's love that went into that and it's, it's, it's feasting for the soul. But as far as uh, needing to top up glycogen reserves, as far as fueling the body, no. Meat and eggs, they're, they're a fantastic fuel source. Uh, yeah. The feasting itself, I, I steal that from Jamie Lewis's Feast, Famine, and Ferocity Protocol. It's still been one of the most effective things I've done. And that means that I'll have lean periods in my training, too. And you can, you can modify meat and eggs so simply with that. Instead of whole eggs, you have egg whites. For the meat, you eat lean meats. You eat uh, turkey breast, chicken breast lean cuts of beef, whatever the case may be. And then during the feasting, you just fatten it up. You eat whole eggs, you eat fatty cuts of meat, you eat beef ribs, you eat chicken wings. There's, it's, uh, I'm part of the, the book that I'm writing. It's going to just explain in detail. It's like, look, like it might seem like meat and eggs is limited, but there's so many combinations out there that, that really you never need to have the same meal twice in a row. Yeah, yeah. So do you follow that feast famine protocol still to this day? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little looser, uh, but ultimately I do like to do about four weeks of feasting and two weeks of famine and, and just kind of keep alternating between that. And, and the famine, it's not about fat loss. It's not about getting lean, but I find what it does is it preps the body for the yeah. nutrients of the feast Yeah. because yeah. after enough time with just, just basically pure protein, the fat really acts like a great fuel source and the body responds incredibly well to that feasting. But I find if you just keep beating it over the head with, with food over and over again, it adapts to that and it no longer kind of has that really supercharged response. Yeah. 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 So are these, is, is there like, is there a method behind this madness, so to speak? Do you target certain like periods of a training block, so to speak? Or is it, is it like just a, Two week, four week, two week, four week, and just a cycling nature, a cyclical nature. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so if I could, yeah, I'll try to match the training up to it because ultimately the nutrition is supposed to support the training. But you know, chaos is the plan, <laughs> and and it's ultimately why I'm doing the the program that I am right now. It's the holiday season. My schedule is constantly in flux. Uh, I signed up for a submission grappling tournament just on a whim. That's going to happen a week from now. That. You know, that's just going to eat a day into my training. Uh, I've been going, I went on a cruise a little bit ago. Family comes into town. And that's why I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to adopt my own plan here because it gives me the flexibility. Uh, ideally, yeah, I'd follow Jamie's approach where it's like for two weeks during the famine period, it's high reps and it's high volume. And then during the feasting, it's uh, low reps and high weight. That seems pretty cool. But ultimately, I make it adapt. Uh, I think deep water would work really well for that because the first two weeks of deep water, you're kind of just learning the program. And then the last four weeks, you put it into overdrive. Two weeks of famine right before you start. And then you just feast your face off during those hellish four weeks. I think that would work out just phenomenal. Super squats, probably similar. The first two weeks, you're you're really kind of getting into what you're going to get into. But after that, it kicks off. Which right now, the program I'm running, I'm doing the, the 20 rep squats at the uh, three times a week. And I'm eating to support it, so that's it's it's been working pretty well. Yeah, there's a there's, there's a sadistic element to that <laughs> famine because when you described there the training protocol to like sync up with that was high volume and high rep, and that kind of goes against the, the 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 thinking that when you are cutting, you need to drop your volume. You need mm. to kind of start to be a bit more mindful of the work you're doing just so that you don't affect recovery. Whereas like, like a Jamie Lewis concept, just things get spun on their head and it's mm. it's a complete assault on the body. Yep. How do you find that famine phase when you are doing that high volume and high reps while eating that protocol style? You know, it's it's just a perfect preparatory phase, and that's the, the way I'm looking at it. You're 
it's not accumulation in the general sense because you're not eating to support accumulation. But what you're doing is you're depleting the body and you're putting it into such a depleted state, like you said, sadistic, so that when the time comes to fill it up, it's ready to soak it up like a sponge. Uh, it, it's ultimately just, it's all about prepping the body for that feast. And knowing that really makes it easy to survive the famine, knowing the reason why you're doing it. Because when people just diet just to look lean, you get to look lean. It's like, well, well, now what? You know, to quote Dan John. But when you say, well, no, the whole reason I'm doing this is because in four or for the next four weeks, I'm going to eat to grow and I want to make sure I get the most out of that. Then there, there's a bit more of what seems like a noble intention behind it. And if nothing else, there's a so what at the end that it makes it worthwhile. When when leanness is the only outcome, you get to look cool for a photograph. And then it's like, well, now what do I do? But when you say, no, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm going to grow bigger as a result of this. And it's just going to keep cycling. Then then it's a lot more sustainable. Right. So let's let's move on to part three. No mm -hmm. lockout should look the same every single day how do we approach that idea knowing that we have to do all that overhead work in our workouts uh, i i'm writing uh, an annex to this but there are so many ways you can get weight over your head that it's absurd and that's just that's just technique wise to say nothing of tempo wise to say nothing of protocol wise uh, you know, if, if I were to say, well, the only thing I want to do is clean and press. I don't want to snatch. I don't want to jerk. I don't want to do the thruster. I don't want to do the cluster. I don't want to do devil presses. I don't want to do uh, single arm presses. And, 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 and saying all the I don't want to do is I'm hoping the audience is picking up all the other ways you could possibly do this. Uh, Viper presses too. But you say, all I want to do is clean and press. I'm like, cool. Okay. Day one, clean and press. Do an every minute on the minute clean and press and do five reps every minute on the minute and do that for 40 minutes. That's workout one. Workout two, we're gonna to do Tabatas, okay? 20 seconds on, clean and press, 10 second rest. 20 seconds on, clean and press, 10 second rest. We're gonna make that a four minute workout. Okay, workout three. All right, now to this one, we're just gonna do a five, three, one workout. You're gonna work up to a top set of three, and then at the end of that, you're gonna do five sets of 10. And then if you wanna do any back off work, we're gonna do clean each rep and press away. Okay, next workout, deep water. All right, now we're gonna do 10 by 10. And you can see that even just taking one movement you can not do the same workout four times in a row. And that was just me spitballing. We can we can definitely extrapolate beyond that. But if we change the movement, then we can go beyond that. If we change the protocol, we go beyond that. There, there's so many avenues that you're, you're not limited when you say, I'm just going to move weight over my head. It's just giving you a vector. Yeah, yeah. So you can approach these workouts with the idea that the overhead work is the foundation, but you can start to implement other exercise round about that and like a socket fashion so absolutely and, and i i call that the uh, the 10 percent corollary in uh, what i've written here and it's this idea that look make the 180 minutes the primary focus but if you want to add 10 percent or take 10 percent of that and use it for something else and in my own approach to this that 10 percent has become very liberal i've been spending a lot more extra time taking care of some extra things but I, I've written out this idea. It's like, let's say your goal was making yourself bigger. So you got your 180 minutes a week. But then on top of that, three times a week, do a 20 rep breathing squat workout and throw that into the end of the workout. Or do um, Dan John's uh, Mass Made Simple high rep squat protocol. Or take Jamie Lewis's squat protocol from uh, Feast, Famine, Ferocity or the Jugger Yoke program. Or do the dog crap. Uh, squat protocol, whatever the case may be, and you can do that to get bigger. Throw in some curls if you want; that's totally fine. Otherwise, yeah, if you want to, if you want to mix it up and throw it into a circuit, that's totally fine too. That's a way you can get some extra work in. Uh, there's, there's no real, yeah, yeah, you know, chaos is the plan. I'm, I'm giving people a guideline as long as they're biting by that 180 minutes a week of putting stuff over their head. If they have more time and they want to do more training, then that's fine. Yeah, yeah. So is there any standout workouts that you've discovered recently? Oh, my goodness. So, so many. Uh, and the big thing is uh, one of the times we talked, I, I did that whole uh, till of all hollow approach here. Uh, I'm letting my training tell a story again. And this time it's the Sumerian Chronicle uh, stealing from Conan the Barbarian. I've let yeah. that be my vector for this one. And as a result, I've had some some pretty nutty workouts there. 
Uh, one of them was, uh, it was called the tree of woe. And the way this workout worked was I would hang from a pull-up bar. And every 30 seconds that I had finished hanging from there, I'd do one pull-up. And then once my grip would go, give out, I would go into a bear complex, which is a clean press, uh, front squat, press overhead, put the bar on your back, squat it, back uh, thruster it over your head, and then put it back down again. Well, then I'd go right back up under the bar. I'd hang from there. And each time I dropped from the bar, I would have to add a rep to that bear complex. And by the time I was done, I think I was doing 12 bear complexes. And what was great about that workout is there's no way to not suffer. <laughs> You're either on the bar feeling your, your body get pulled apart because you've been hanging on a pull-up bar or you're doing bear complexes and the bear complexes just keep adding up. And so they add up and that means you have more rest from the bar, which means that after you've done all those complexes, you can hang from the bar longer. Yippee, you know, what a reward. Yeah. And then yeah. you hang from the bar, but you want to hang from the bar as long as you can because it's keeping you safe from those damn bear complexes. Yeah. How the fuck do you come up with that shit, Johnny? I, I genuinely do not know. Uh, it's it's where my it's just what my brain does. And it's so frustrating because I don't have control over it coming up with these ideas. I'll just be sitting there and it'll say, hey, you know, it would suck this. And I'm like, God damn it. Yep. That that would suck. I guess we're doing that tomorrow. Right. So so what were the forearm doms like after the tree of war? So, say that again. Oh, the, the forearm yeah, what, uh, what you know, they, they weren't too bad. Uh, I use a, a monkey grip where I put my thumb over the bar. Uh, and right. so uh, it wasn't so much the, the hanging from the bar that was um, – it wasn't so much the forearms. It was more um, the, the traps in the back just from having held on to there for so long. I will say, though, the issue was that when I would try to clean the bear complexes afterwards, that sucked because, yeah, I had no grip in me. Uh, and so I was at risk of just launching the, the barbell into my face. Uh, I think if I were to do it again, I'd use an axle just because I could uh, continental it instead of have to clean it. Uh, but yeah, yeah that, that part of it really sucked. Yeah. So what is the worst doms you've had recently from one of these workouts? Oh, geez. Um, oh, well, so um, I did my annual Thanksgiving Day tradition uh, workout, uh, and that was a trap bar deadlift, uh, 135 pounds for as many reps as possible. And so this completely broke the protocol because it wasn't putting weight over my head. But chaos is the plan. It's a tradition. And I still wrote it in, into the story. I'm like, you know what? This just sucks. Uh, and so I did uh, 301 reps unbroken. Uh, and I woke up the next morning in, and my traps just felt like I'd been hit by a truck. Uh, and and it, I'm finally feeling somewhat normal after that one. Uh, another one that I did, though, that was more in line with the uh, protocol was a uh, wheel of pain. And uh, what I did for that one was took an axle, held it in a zercher carry position, and I marched in place with it. And then uh, every minute on the minute when the timer would go off, I would drop the axle and then I would clean and push press it overhead. And same thing, each round I would add a push press to it. So anytime that I wasn't push pressing, I was zercher carrying an axle, which I had to march in place because I was in my garage. But this would be a great workout to take to a track. And just like the, the Tree of Woe, you, you think, oh, boy, I get to finally put this axle down. But all it means is I had to clean and press it a whole bunch of times. Uh, so that put a good amount of uh, torque on my upper back and biceps. <laughs> so do you plan these workouts the night before? Or do you sit and have a brainstorming session like, and then like at the weekend? And then I, I never intentionally go for it. But usually like when I'm in bed and like trying to drift off to sleep, these will pop in. But I've legit have some of these workouts come up to me while I was putting my shoes on for the workout where I was, uh, you know, I, I did my ritual. I came downstairs. I drank my, my green tea. I, I put on my my gym clothes and I came down with one plan. And then in the middle of it, I'm like, wait, no, this is a better idea. And just said, all right, let's go ahead and do that then. So were any of these workouts, like what one of these workouts at some point did you go, this is a big fucking mistake? <laughs> uh, I would say every single one up to this point. Um, but uh, the Tree of Woe definitely caught me off guard. I definitely thought I'd have more in me than what I ended up doing. And uh, it, I, I still said I'm going to do this for 40 minutes, and I absolutely did. But when I was done, I was, I was ultimately surprised at how gassed you get from hanging from a bar. Yeah, because I yeah. thought this was not going to be a conditioning effort. I thought just like, you know, I'm like, this is going to be a grip strength effort. But I would drop from the bar to hanging from it, and I'd just be bent over wheezing. I'm like, I didn't do anything. Why am I so tired? Yeah, so that, that, that definitely caught me the most off guard. 
it, it, it would be also be the mental aspect of just hanging there in time mm-hmm. and moving really slowly, mm-hmm. like really mm-hmm. slowly. And that would that would be quite brutal. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it, my, my grandpa was famous for saying, "If you ever want time to pass slowly, just hang by your thumbs." <laughs> so, so, right, so, what's the what's the mode of attack for this book? How is it going to be released? So the, the unfortunate thing is I've written all the fun parts already and now comes the boring stuff. And it's hard for me to get motivated to do that uh, because what I want to do is I do want to describe just the basics of all the overhead stuff. I want to get some photos in it so people know what a cluster looks like versus a thruster. I, I want to get the mechanics down. I want to include some very simple cooking instructions for people who can't boil water just to make it that eggs and meat is a viable option because it really shouldn't be all that complicated. Uh, and then once that's done, it's, you know, I'm, I'm probably just going to rough copy it, make it a PDF, release it on my blog and find wherever else we'll host it. Uh, I have no set schedule for it. Uh, it's just, I'm, I'm writing it as, uh, as the free time shows up, but, but you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And that's ultimately what it boils down to is doing something I like when I want to do it. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's quite a nice gesture, Jared. That's a very well, nice gesture. Just putting it out to the world, all that yeah, hard yeah. work. Yeah, well, and you know that's the that's the big thing I'm excited about right now is I'm actually field testing it. I've had a few other people say that they're willing to give it a try too, which I'm like, hey, you know, more power to you. Let me know how it goes. Yeah, if I yeah, yeah. Models behind it, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, because you definitely want to get like a few guinea pigs in there, so to speak, mm-hmm. to see the, the the brutality unfold. Well, and especially since it, it leaves so much to the reader to come up with what they're going to do. That it, uh, What I love is that people with different backgrounds are going to try it. You know, so, some guy who's got a weightlifting background, when I say, hey, put something over your head for 180 minutes, they're going to come up with just madness compared to what I've come up with. And I would love to see the outcome of that. A CrossFit guy is going to be different than a strongman guy. A powerlifter is going to say, what the F is this? How do I put it over my head? You know, it's it's going to be a, a new experience for everyone who does it. They're all going to tell their own story and, and they're all going to come up with their own solutions. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, Jared, we'll wrap this up. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. You, you, you're, you're our mind blown guest. Always, <laughs> always a pleasure to have you on. Well, thanks, Lee. Uh, it's a fast hour. Ah, it's fast. It's always fast, mate. People know where to get you, Emma Vass, because you, you, you're not. You're quite low key, like mm-hmm. on social mm-hmm. media, uh, yep. and I don't blame you. It's a, it's a complete cesspit. <laughs> uh, Jared, once again. Absolute honour to have you on. Well, thanks so much, Lee. Thank you very much.